Um, my name is Jill Zacharias, and I'll be chairing the call today. And I would just really like to welcome everyone to the call. This is an amazing opportunity ahead of us here today. And I think this will be a really productive call. Because we have so many participants on the line, I'm going to ask everyone to um, just use the chat box to state your name and your organization, where you're from, and then we can get a good record of who's on the call today. I hope you're all surviving the cold. We're definitely in the midst of winter, and it looks like it's across the province, even with snow in the, the lower mainland. So, um, yeah, so welcome, everyone. As you know, in March of last year, the province of BC released their first poverty reduction strategy, Together BC, mandated through the Poverty Reduc Reduction Act. Together BC is based on four principles, affordability, opportunity, reconciliation, and social inclusion. The intent of the Poverty Reduction Planning and Action Program is to support local governments in reducing poverty at the local level and to support the province's poverty reduction strategy. The province has provided five million over three years and the program is being administered by the Union of BC Municipalities or UBCM. This really is an unprecedented move. Uh, you know, I think it's the first time in Canada that a provincial government is supporting the rollout of a provincial strategy at the local level. To qualify for funding, applications must demonstrate the extent to which proposed activities will reduce poverty at the local level and focus on one or more of the six priority action areas identified in Together BC, housing, families, children, and youth, education and training, employment, income supports, and social supports. It's got to be a new project, so retroactive funding is not available. This is pretty typical. And you have to be capable of completing the project within one year from the date that the grant is approved. Another important thing is that you have to involve key sectors of the community, including community-based poverty reduction organizations, people with the lived or living experience of poverty, business, local First Nations, and or Indigenous organizations. And so within these six priority areas, eligible projects may also address one or more of uh, other key priorities identified in Together BC, mental health and addictions, food security, transportation, and or access to healthcare. So there's two streams. One is the planning piece, how to develop a community-wide common agenda and local poverty reduction strategy. And stream two, is the high impact ideas for implementation. And again, they must align with Together BC. So this is really an exciting opportunity. And we want to ensure that it's successful. So on this call today, Spark BC, which is the social planning and Research Council of BC, the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition, and the Tamarack Institute will speak to the resources, tools, and supports that each of their organizations are able to provide to support communities' readiness to plan for high-impact projects, meet the eligibility requirements, and submit applications by the grants February 28, 2020 deadline. So each of these three organizations is able to offer support to cities and communities, both in terms of creating proposals and 
in rolling out promises made over the 12 month period. The intent is to provide a range of resources, tools, connections, and supports that make it easy as possible for communities to apply. Some communities might feel this, this is daunting, and, but the support is there to help you choose a direction based on best practices, capacity, and level of readiness. So we all want to work together to help maximize this opportunity to the best of our ability. And I think that one thing for me that is really exciting is that because this opportunity is through UBCM, it's going to engage municipalities in poverty reduction, community-based poverty reduction efforts in a, in a way that is probably unprecedented across the province. So this is, this is pretty cool. So we're going to have uh, three presentations for you today. And then you'll have an, a good opportunity for questions and discussions. So um, I don't know how everyone feels if we want to be able to ask questions as we go along, or if, uh, if I think if something is burning, uh, you, you have a burning question as we go along, uh, pop it up in the, in the chat box or, or just, uh, you know, and, and I'll try and track that and see if we can guide the discussion from there. But keep in mind, we will have some opportunity for discussion after the presentations as well. So without further ado, um, we'll see who's going first here. Do you want to just switch it over to the next slide? I'll turn it over to Allison for, uh, to let you know what supports uh, Tamarack and their vibrant communities cities reducing poverty initiative can support. Thanks so much, Jill. Um, and I'd like to reiterate as well that we're really excited to be on this call and to be working with the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition in Spark BC, um, really with the goal of supporting as many communities as possible to access this unique funding opportunity. Um, I know within Tamarack, um, we've actually shifted the way that we distributed the work. So I've always, I've been the manager of Western cities um, and still in that role. But um, whereas last year I was supporting BC and Alberta communities, we are shifting my workload so I can devote all of my attention to BC and to this grant and supporting communities. So I'm really excited about that and see where we can get to, um, you know, through this funding stream. Um, in terms of getting that local funding for poverty reduction that we've really been asking for for a long time. Um, I believe there's a few people on the call who may not be familiar with the network. Um, so Vibrant Communities, Cities Reducing Poverty, um, we're a national movement and learning network and community. We have 80 members across the country uh, representing 300 plus communities across Canada and now a couple in the States as well. And the four, the four areas of support that we prioritize are supporting members to move through the stages of development, developing a common agenda and community plan, tracking and reporting on outcomes, and achieving financial and leadership sustainability. Um, so for the purpose of this call, I wanted to focus a little bit on the second priority, um, and that's one of this funding application, this grant opportunity is to support communities to develop community plans. And next slide. So under stream one, um, this is where communities will be either developing new community plans or updating existing ones. The criteria uh, for the grant is quite flexible, so it doesn't have to necessarily be a poverty reduction strategy. It can be a related um, plan and on the, uh, the grant homepage it lists some examples that are eligible. But for communities who are looking to build, um, to 
to use this opportunity to create a plan. Um, this is something that Tamarack has been supporting for a long time with communities across Canada and the States. Um, so some of the resources and tools we're able to provide um, include help planning for high impact projects. So um, I'm gonna go into a bit more detail on the collaborative approach that, um, we, that we support members through in terms of developing not necessarily a strategic plan uh, from a municipal perspective, but more around developing a common agenda that really engages the whole community across sectors. And um, we know there's a few uh, potential challenges in terms of meeting the February 28th deadline, um, one of which may be obtaining a council resolution, um, really uh, making the case to council to take the lead and to support this application, um, and also just around getting the application together and meeting those eligibility requirements, um, including milestones, activities, timeline, and budget. Um, so I kind of see it in two stages. The one is the immediate priority in terms of meeting uh, the grant requirements and getting the application in. And then the second is that ongoing support um, for the grants duration um, 12 months and beyond. So I'll give some examples of supports we can offer there as well. Next slide. So this is a guide that um, I've just put together. Um, what it does is it it provides an overview of um, a proven approach that we've used to support communities to develop plans and this is through developing a community-wide common agenda that creates a foundation for that plan and from its core it really engages four key sectors from uh, from the start so government business nonprofit, and folks with lived and living experience of poverty um, it builds on community assets um, and creates collaborative solutions. There's a really intensive um, community engagement process over the course of the year that really brings in uh, voices and perspectives from the community at large. Um, and, it, and it really builds momentum so that the work is continuing. There's action teams that are tackling wins. Um, we're building engagement. And by the time that the plan is launched, launched, um, it's actually already been implemented by a huge range of partners and they've already bought in. Um, so this is a, a guide that I'm going to share with you all um, in the follow-up email. Um, on the next slide. So as part of that guide, we I put together some of the key milestones, some ideas that you can use to map out what those 12 months could look like. Um, there's some key resources in there that might be helpful um, around the common agenda approach, um, a case study, a guide, a couple tools. I have Revel Stokes actually part of this process right now. So we're working with Jill. They did an amazing event report uh, from their top 100 event. Um, in, the in the appendices, there's also a draft budget and a resource compendium that covers some of the big topics of this grant. Um, so making the case and engaging local government collaborating across sectors that includes the two 10 guys 10 guides that we've developed around engaging business um, and this year's 10 guide to engaging people with lived and living experience um, that one was developed with an incredible uh, committee um, of partners with lived and living experience who who we wrote that together with um, and evaluation is always I think a topic of interest and we need to show through these grants that we are going to go beyond um, outputs and, and start getting to outcomes and impact. So on the next slide. Um, so you, you'll see on, on the Tamarack website, we have lots of resources that are available to the public. We have resource uh, libraries under uh, collective impact, community engagement, evaluation, and so forth. 
Uh, this community of practice is one that folks can sign on to on an ongoing basis. So we have calls bi-monthly and over, over the next year we will be tying those in uh, to these grants. So some of the topics will, will be relevant over the course of the year. Um, the guides, publications and tools that I mentioned are all publicly available on the website as well. Um, if you want, if you're looking for more intensive support, we do offer a membership and it's through the membership that you'd access the um, expert coaching, which is the um, intensive support towards developing a common agenda. Um, that's with monthly calls over the 12 month periods. Through that you get um, well, access, you get a manager of cities that provides one-on-one -on -one support, and then just deeper access to the learning communities. So um, the strength of the learning community really comes from our members. Um, you know, they've done some incredible work across BC and across the country. So if you're looking for those high impact examples of, of what's worked, um, down to really nitty gritty resources like terms of reference and, you know, things that aren't always um, publicly available, we can usually connect you to somebody who will have what you need um, within the network. Um, so that's a quick overview of the learning supports. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, so this, um, I focused a little bit more on that developing a community plan stream one side of supports. Um, and I know that Vivica um, with the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition is going to speak a little bit more to stream two um, and some really great examples of what communities can implement. Um, and Lorraine uh, from Spark BC at the end is going to share what, she, what they're able to support, especially in terms of accessing data and making the case, which I know is a big challenge as well. Um, I guess, uh, Jill, did you want to check if we have any clarifying questions, uh, urgent questions for now? Otherwise, we can do the discussion at the end. For sure. I think, uh, uh, you know, please feel free to, to speak up right now if you have any burning questions for Alison. Not hearing anything immediate. Uh, you know, I just want to say that, you know, the, the benefit of cities reducing poverty learning supports has been, has been incredible for us. You know, I think, and, and in particular, just those best practices, so many examples of plans that um, other communities have done and, you know, just to uh, across the country, but also it just, you know, has given us a sense that we are not on our own here, that we are part of a, a larger movement, that there's people across the country working on poverty reduction. And so in many areas, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And it's been, um, it's just been so, you know, it, it increases your efficiency, it increases your feeling of, uh, of being supported uh, in, in kind of the larger context, which has been so valuable. Okay. Thank you so much, Allison. And without further ado, we will uh, turn to Vivica from the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition, who I believe is next. Welcome, Vivica. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jill. I hope everybody can hear me all right. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting us to join in this call today. My name is Vivica Ellis, and I'm the Interim Community Organizer with the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition at this time. Um, just for those of you that may be new to the coalition, uh, we are a provincial coalition of around 400 supporting members and over 100 core members, and we're focused on provincial public policy advocacy to reduce and end poverty. And we spent a large part of the last 10 years focused on advocating for a provincial poverty reduction strategy. So, of course, now we're in this very busy time where we, we have one and we have to dig in and, and look at what more we need to do. So, so that's a little bit about us. Um, I think given the fact that we're a provincially focused um, advocacy organization, I just wanted to, um, we do have a guide um, for municipalities that uh, has recently been updated and it's available on our website. 
website and that will be sent out um, at the end with the, the follow-up package from this webinar. But I just wanted to pull out some highlights, not necessarily priorities, but some highlights from that guide to share with everything, everybody today. So one of the, maybe the next slide please, um, Hannah would be great. Thank you. So one of the things that we recommend is adopting a stream framework. And what we mean by this is that for a long time now we've used this um, way of looking at the kinds of strategies we can develop in terms of are they upstream and tackling the root causes of poverty or are they remaining downstream and focusing and dealing uh, with immediate symptoms showing up in our communities. So we just want to bring this um, to the forefront here because there is a danger that a lot of funding and good work and effort can be put into efforts that are still far too downstream to actually have an impact on reducing or eliminating poverty in, in communities. Um, and we, ha we have a good example that we like to share around food security. Um, and there's a quote here, it says, community gardens and other local efforts can support important goals like social connectedness and a more sustainable food system, but research shows that household food insecurity can't be fixed through food-based initiatives or charitable efforts. So we view household food insecurity as very much an income-based problem that requires income-based solutions, although we know community gardens and other very important initiatives like that do have an impact. Um, so that's why when we move further on in our slides, we'll discuss how we would see the implementation of the living wage for families as a very relevant step towards reducing um, food insecurity. So the next step, please, or next uh, slide would be great. Thank you. So another thing that we've been focused on for quite some time is um, transit equity and universal access. So we wanted to highlight um, the, the importance of transit. Through our All On Board campaign, um, we've gained a very, very deep understanding of the way lack of access to affordable transit um, impacts those in the greatest depths of poverty, including homeless people, people with disabilities, youth who have aged out of care, um, single parents, low-wage workers. Um, and the impact of access to affordable transit on these communities is enormous when it comes to access to health care, um, all of the, the mobility that we need, people need to access services, education and jobs and the opportunities they need to move forward in their lives, especially school in the case of children and youth. Um, and the guide does mention specifically that pilot projects to evaluate the impact of providing support such as reduced fare transit, recreation passes or other service opportunities for low-income residents are um, priorities. So we just wanted to emphasize uh, that from our perspective, focusing on, on something like affordable transit and a pilot project on affordable transit would be a very upstream solution because it also can lead to the coordinated ongoing advocacy to our provincial government to increase funding in affordable transit and transit infrastructure in our communities throughout British Columbia. So that's just uh, one thing we wanted to, I wanted to highlight today. One thing to mention is that there are a lot of excellent examples of how various municipalities and communities and cities around across Canada and in BC as well have linked affordable transit measures to their low income leisure access recreational passes. Um, and so that's there's certainly something that you know we would advocate communities explore as they're developing their poverty reduction strategies. Okay, next slide please. So we also wanted to draw everyone's attention to um, the very, very impactful work of Pivot Legal Society um, and what they call a stigma audit. So many of the bylaws and law enforcement practices that municipalities have in place or may put uh, in place do violate the human rights of people living in poverty. So we just wanted to inject into this discussion today a discussion about the criminalization of people who live in public space, how that increases stigma and restricts the delivery of harm reduction programs, emergency shelter and other services for marginalized people. Um, so we recommend that local governments listen to people living in poverty and address the ways that their bylaws infringe on their human rights and increase stigma and discrimination. Um, and there is, uh, Pivot has created what is called a stigma audit um, that municipal governments, it's a tool that municipal governments can use um, 
to sort of a- analyze how they may be criminalizing poverty um, and how they can revoke laws that penalize or discriminate against people for engaging in behavior necessary for survival because of homelessness and, and poverty, such as sleeping and erecting shelter in public spaces. So we wanted to draw attention to this today because as municipalities develop their poverty reduction strategies and plans, we also need to look at, at what municipalities may have in the works that, that further deeply stigmatizes and disrupts access to service for those most marginalized in the depths of poverty and in addiction and homelessness within communities. So we just wanted to draw attention to that. Next slide, please. And you can get in touch with Pivot for more information about their project inclusion report and the stigma audit. Um, Finally, we just wanted to emphasize wages um, and the importance of, of the incomes of parents and, and um, all community members and the impact on poverty. So the majority of people in BC are primarily working in poverty and the majority of poor children in BC living, live in families with parents in the paid labor force many of them working full time and often multiple jobs. So we very much feel that local governments have a responsibility to avoid contributing to the problem of low wage poverty. So we strongly recommend a consideration of the living wage for families as a, a key strategy and, and pillar um, as a part of um, municipal poverty reduction strategies um, to pay all their employees a living wage and then only contract for services with companies that pay a living wage. And then to also, of course, mobilize um, businesses and, and all the other employers within communities to also become um, living wage employers. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, the other piece we really want to draw attention to is our universal publicly funded child care system. So we know local governments are responsible for local regulations such as development zoning and can require that child care spaces be included in new public buildings. Um, you know, school boards can ensure stability for the many child care programs that operate on school sites. Um, and so at this time, if you could actually maybe skip to the next slide. Um, so I just wanted to tie it in here. Um, this really ties into what, what we wanted to, to highlight in terms of how municipalities can include in their poverty reduction strategies advocacy to senior levels of government to increase the investment that we need to see to truly impact poverty, that the investment that intertwines with our local community plans to truly reduce poverty. Um, and so to, uh, the, in terms of uh, universally funded child care system, our, our system is in a state of development at this time. Um, and one of the main pieces is, um, you know, in our opinion, phasing out the current program of one-off capital grants and proactively ensuring that all public capital funding creates publicly owned facilities. And this is drawing from the 10-a-day policy briefing note that was put out recently in, um, about recommendations for effective expansion of licensed childcare spaces in BC. Um, adding publicly funded modular buildings to public property uh, that is something that municipalities very much have control over and moving the child care capital program to the Ministry of Education. So I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, we offer child care in our communities, um, but emphasis on, on these planks that are necessary in the development of our universally funded child care system are very essential to total poverty reduction and the impact of our new child care system on poverty in the province. And then the other pieces here will be income assistance that um, I know I took a look at about 10 poverty reduction, local poverty reduction plans yesterday and advocacy to uh, senior levels of government was in all, included in all of them. Um, and so we would mention that income assistance and raising the rates to the market bas basket measure poverty line be included within municipal poverty reduction plans as an advocacy piece, as well as wages and working conditions. So I just wanted to leave it there um, and see if anybody has any immediate questions and perhaps we can uh, move on to the next presenter. Thank you very much everybody for listening. Thank you so much Vivica, that really puts things into perspective and, uh, and, and also hopefully will generate some ideas. Uh, so does anyone have any particular burning questions for Vivica at this time? Okay, hearing none, we will uh, move on to our third and final presenter, Lorraine from Spark DC. Hi, thank you. 
I also have Roland Silver here. He's just recently joined Spark and is helping us on a few initiatives, including our work around accessibility and inclusion. So I just wanted you to know that we have some, some capacity here to help on this stuff. Um, I'm talking about when I thought about how to add to the really great work that the coalition's doing and that Tamarack's been doing on kind of pushing the margins. I thought about that Spark has often done work around targeted strategies or evidence-based approaches and that this might be something that we can bring to the conversation and help those who are really doing great work in communities. Uh, we have, um, as those who work with us know, a 50-year history of working with people in communities on a range of social policy issues and that our board emphasizes the importance of poverty reduction. We also had the privilege recently of working with the province to do the consultations on uh, uh, that helped to shape the development of the, the first poverty reduction plan for the province. And so you can see firsthand how important this type of funding is for local governments and how many are struggling with, with the deep questions around poverty. So we see that we could help to add some information or resources. We've been um, helping with the uh, um, community social data strategy for a number of years and have good capacity around the type of data or information available in communities and that would include our work with First Call and uh, the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition, but First Call in the annual child poverty report card. So the idea is, is there a way to bring resources or information into the conversation that it can be more evidence-based and help to a, draw attention to just the depth and the importance of the need and then how to work with communities and local government partners to actually push, push the margins. So you'll see on my next slide, Vivica and Allison asked me to talk about, well, what type of information might be available through the social data strategy? So Stats Canada has a number of different measures. So uh, part of it is LIM. Some of the data will be available through LIM, which is the low income measure, which is roughly at that kind of 50% of the median. LICO and before and after tax, which is the low income cutoff, and which, which is a kind of measure that you can actually look at the, the benefits. The after tax shows how many people are lifted out of poverty by some of the types of initiatives that have been put into place by other levels of government and how important this is. And these types of measures would be valuable in terms of reinforcing some of the strategies that Vivica outlined in her presentation. And then more recently, the community data strategy has also cut the census profile along the market basket measure. And I think the jury's still out on how, how valuable some of the, the benchmarks are within that. I know there's questions around housing and that, but it's at least another measure and the start towards having a real poverty line in Canada and so we could look at it along those lines or more importantly give communities that kind of information to understand your needs. Um, key social demographic groups, so again uh, we have lots of information on families, we have a special target group profile along seniors and then uh, have done a lot of work on families with children who are living in poverty and more recently also have uh, people with disabilities living in poverty. So if these are areas of importance to the groups working on the kind of strategy development across the communities that you're working with, feel free to reach out to me or Roland and we'll see what we can do in terms of pulling you the data or the type of information that could help to, to bring, amplify the voice around the importance of this work. There are also other target group profiles that we would have. So there are many groups that are at increased risk of poverty and that would be Indigenous people and communities and so we would have profiles along those dimensions as well as single parent families. We know that there is a gender based uh, um, issue related to poverty and that many single parent families are among those who are most vulnerable and also low income seniors who are struggling. So again, if these are specific groups and you, you see these needs in your community, for sure, let's have a conversation. As you do this work, it's also important just to look at the type of data that can speak to how you would help to break the dynamics of poverty and low income. And so there would be important data sets available through the, the social data strategy around access to employment, education and housing. And again, we'll do our best to kind of pull that information that would be most meaningful to you, either as you put your submission together or as communities actually start to roll up your sleeves and develop your plan and want to know what type of information might be available to support that. 
I should give a shout out to our community partners. So the community data program actually does allow us to have access to over $100,000 worth of data. And it's all about making it available to communities. And Metro Vancouver has been an important partner around this, as has this been the City of Vancouver and the Fraser Valley. And then Spark has also tried to bring our assets and resources into these conversations. But our goal is to have these resources available to support communities. So that's a general overview of the data and the kind of information that might be available. And just um, I really want to give a shout out to those who are really working hard on the ground to make that difference. So Lorraine, we just have a quick question here uh, from Anne in Williams Lake, who's curious whether the, the target group profiles will be available at, at, at the local community level or just at, at a higher level, at the provincial level. No, we can take it down to the community level. So, so for anyone on the call or anyone not on the call but who would see this as being of value, just send an email to me and I'd be happy to work with you. Roland and I will start to pull customized profiles for those communities who say, yes, this would actually help us in the work that we're doing and we really value this. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Lorraine. And I do know that the community data program is available across the province at the, the uh, community level for sure. All right, Lorraine, would you like to continue? Oh, that was pretty much it. I felt that there should be a bit of time available for questions, so I'm happy to take questions or um, I know that I saw some questions coming in around uh, process and procedure around the UBCM application, so maybe you want to jump to that. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's, uh, you know, we've got such great resources here in the province. So we're just going to take a few minutes now. We've had a few questions, one around whether or not the, the council resolution has to go in with the application. And, um, you know, Carrie Wall from Cranbrook had, uh, you know, specifically asked UBCM about that. And they said as long as they know it's coming, then you could submit your application by the February 28th deadline and then submit the, UBC, uh, the council resolution afterwards if necessary. But if you're considering something like that, I would definitely recommend contacting UBCM, contacting the, the contacts uh, that are outlined in the program guide and just making sure that they're aware that this is going to be the case uh, with your application. Another question that we had from Anne was, uh, again, this, you know, looking at the community um, data program and whether or not that uh, information can be really boiled down at a local level. And for the most part, it can. Have, but, you know, we're all double so here. We've had some good, um, you know, results from accessing the community data program. Okay, so Anne is saying, does Spark PC have data available to the communities outside the lower mainland? Yes, so um, yeah, we actually do pay the $100,000 fee to the community data program so that anyone who works with us has access to that information. And we have good levels of data and actually um, good expertise on how to pull that data. So we're happy to make it available. And it's something we've been leading for more than 10 years. So we are um, happy to make it available and see that as part of what we want to do as we work with communities. Yeah, and that's just great. Thanks so much, Lorraine. It's a, it's a real resource for small yeah. rural communities that can't afford to access the data for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, this is just here. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. This, yeah. You can hear me? Yeah. Yes, you can. I, I just have a, um, a question for Vivica about her sort of really excellent presentation. I mean, they all were, but I think that this, the one about sort of advocacy to senior levels of government is important. I wonder if, Vivica, you could say a little bit about um, the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition's um, human rights-based approach 
because I think that's been key to to uh, to the development and talk a little bit about that. Um, absolutely. Um, just briefly, um, we do take a human rights approach to, to ending poverty. And, and what's very much emerging at this time from our um, sort of deep dive into our existing policy framework and what uh, and the necessity of emerging with a somewhat renewed framework at this time is a focus on universal basic services and how investing in universally accessible um, basic services truly kind of levels the playing field for all of us. Um, and by universal basic services, um, I'm referring to seven primary um, areas. So there's housing, um, child care and education, health care, information, um, democracy, um, and legal services, and food. I think I've, I've named them all, and transport. So positioning um, access to legal aid um, and access to information and the internet, which is very, very crucial for most people, access to uh, transport, transportation, um, along with housing and our healthcare system and our education system and building a robust, universally publicly accessible, completely public childcare system. We're really focused at this time on identifying how um, when we look at municipalities and, and where they're spending in our federal and provincial investment in universal basic services, truly means that to meet the necessities of life, which we have a human right to, does not depend on the money in our pockets. So whether or not um, you know you you can get on that bus to get to the the, the food bank where you need to access um, your meal, that is something that doesn't depend on, on whether you have that two dollars because there is a program that ensures that that if you are hard up and you're struggling that you are included in that transit system. So I just at this time I think that's about what what I I, I will share. We do have resources on our website about how. Um, our human rights framework frames our policy, and I think that we can include some some links to that framing in the follow up package that Allison and Jill and everybody will send out after this if that's um, um, an, an approach that some municipalities are interested in 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 taking in the development of their poverty reduction strategies, which is what we would recommend. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I, well, I'm, I'm familiar with it. I, I just uh, thought it was important that actually that human rights-based approach is actually talked about because I think it's, it, it, it essentially sort of underpins everything that, that you're talking about. And just a little bit on the relationship to the, the quote that you gave about uh, food insecurity. I couldn't agree more. I've been working on that for many, many years. And I think that um, the more that one can stress income-based approaches to these problems – not just in terms of wages, but actually also in terms of social agencies, health agencies, whatever the, the, the social programs are, to be adequately funded so that they can actually, in terms of the food security question, purchase the kind of food that actually is needed uh, uh, in terms of the, of, the, of the people that they're working with. So I, I, I think that's absolutely essential. And the, the last little point I'll make while I've got you on the phone is that, you know, in Qualicum Beach, um, in Parksville, I mean, there have been really sort of critical issues about, you know, the Parksville Council being very opposed to housing people, you know, in cold weather, homeless people in cold weather. We're working on that. There are a variety of small groups, but I'm, when, when I hear you, you talk, I can think of the bigger cities actually having the capacity around, you know, to use these grants. But I think in our community here, maybe in many rural communities, an initial step is actually really just bringing people together in the first place. I mean, I don't know whether that counts for funding, but it um, uh, before one even gets to the council and gets their approval, it it it, it it's a uh, it's it's a it's a fact of you know sort of territorial justice I think to look at look at those kind of issues in rural BC and to just really have that lens that human right lens when we're thinking about planning when we're thinking about project development we thank you so much so we just have a a couple more um, 
questions here in the chat box uh, from Morag to, to Lorraine here. Uh, she's just uh, confirming. So do, you, do we have to be members of Spark BC in order to access uh, the community profile supports and the data supports, Lorraine? Or it's my understanding that you're accessing, at, that and anybody who asks, you're willing to work with at this point. Is that correct? Yeah, 100%. So the issue is that it takes a bit of time to pull data. So um, yeah, all I want to do is know that you want the data. Eventually, we'll yeah. event could do profiles for everyone, but we'll start with those who are interested in this kind of approach, and we'll work with you to give you the best data we have. That's great. Thank you so much, Lorraine. So we do have another question from the, the team at BC Healthy Communities. So one of the requirements for eligibility was uh, demonstrating the extent of impact of the project. So this question I would be for all three of you, for Alison, Vivica, and Lorraine. Over the course of only a year, do you have any ideas for how best to, to demonstrate the potential impact of your project within the, the application context? I can Allison, take a run at it. Oh, no worries. Lorraine, Lorraine huh. do you want to <laughs> go for it? Start. So, Allison yeah. would be the better person possibly to speak to it, but I can think of it in terms of the food security area, just access to healthy food for kids. I'm sure you can demonstrate the real Im financial impacts of that by giving kids the best start in life. I think there are good data sets around the cost of housing and the cost of people not having housing homelessness um, here in the Lower Mainland, they would have costed just the extra staffing and some of the costs around camps, or we know that affordable housing is way more cost effective than the emergency shelter kind of approach. So again, municipalities might want to look at that in some ways or the impact on emergency rooms. And so I think um, as municipalities roll up their sleeves and look at what part they want to play, Access to employment, again, is huge and uh, is a really important piece to allow people to, to realize their full potential, but will have financial benefit for everyone that you could also quantify. So those are Great. just some thoughts. Allison, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I think those are some, some really good ideas and they hit on the same, um, what tamarack has been calling game changer areas and they also, um, those domains really align with the Together BC priori priorities, which we know that projects need to align with. Um, from Tamarack's side of things, uh, we did offer a Getting to Impact series uh, last year, which is the six module series with Mark Kabaj. Um, and we have we have resources from that series, PowerPoints, um, recordings, resources, and it, we really we worked with a range of communities and um, with the goal of supporting um, them to move from reporting on activities uh, towards outcomes and impact. Um, so looking at you know programs that you're running. Um, but also things like how do you track um, community awareness and buy-in? How do you track progress towards systems and policy change? And I think it's a curriculum that's accessible, you know, to, to more, you know, members that are more, more advanced, more developed in the work. Um, but also we did have um, some communities part of that series that were not, that they didn't yet have property reduction plans and were st still able to, um, to apply this and do, you know, a, a maybe a less um, in-depth um, version of an impact report, but where they could still show progress under some of those themes. Um, so that's something I can also share for some ideas. And um, so Vivica here from the Poverty Reduction Coalition. I just wanted to emphasize and support what, what Allison is saying um, in terms of the um, game changers. And I think that, and I'm sure everybody can still hear me, there was just a change on the line. Um, yeah, you know, one good. of the things, oh, okay, is that just the game changers, we would call those at the Poverty Reduction Coalition here, just, you know, high impact upstream 
uh, measures. And I think because the time frame is short and the need is dire and getting worse every day, um, and we have very ambitious poverty reduction targets set provincially and legislated, um, we really have to hone in on those high impact projects that are going to have a lot of impact because they're, you know, I don't know how long the poverty reduction strategy you could have a three, five, ten year plan that's incredibly detailed and long term and those are extremely important. But what can municipalities implement in the short term that have that impact? And I would just like to go back to transit and also when it comes to food, I think, you know, school lunch programs, for example, um, that are universally accessible to all children, not income tested within school systems are something that um, municipalities can can pilot and test and then potentially we can also aim for a robust provincial investment to support um, provincial school lunch programs and then also the federal support for that. So I'm just looking at, um, so that's one piece. And the other one would be, you know, free transit for youth. We've heard from so many youth um, about the impact of being ticketed um, and uh, just trying to get to school and work and around. So, you know, if you have a cohort of youth and you have some academic partnerships and, and you ensure that we're, you know, ensure that we're actually analyzing and studying and evaluating the impact, um, the removing barriers such as access to the mobility that people need can have a very immediate impact that's measurable. Um, and there are a lot of many people out there who are willing to partner to really ensure that, that we are measuring impact. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate Allison's emphasis on those game changers and how we may not, there's, this funding is limited and we're not going to be able to put all of the strategies and, and, and uh, plans in place that we would want, but we need to hone in on those high impact game changers that can have uh, really shift the dial in a shorter period of time and, and, and they're worth doing. Thank you. And you know, thank you so much, Vivica. And I, I would really like to emphasize too, like for the planning piece for stream one, when you think about like what what are the impact what is the impact going to be in your community of actually bringing the partners together, bringing business today to the table, hearing the voices, people with living experience, developing a strategy, engaging their municipality, like at building a common agenda. You know, this has an opportunity to bring people together around a key issue in our community, one of the, you know, like um, just foundational social issues in, in our community like never before. So, you know, I'd really encourage each and every one of you to think about what is the impact of that, that convening that, uh, you know, going to be uh, you know, sometimes for the first time around poverty reduction in, in your community. It's, it's going to move the needle like it, it has never before. So to think about impact, not only for the implementation piece and kind of those low, low hanging fruit of high impactful activities that Vivica is mentioning, but also for that planning piece as well. So I think we're, we're, um, almost done. We could probably have time for one more quick question before we move on to, um, to Allison to wrap up the call today. Is there anything else uh, that people would like to, to talk about? Okay, hearing none, thank you very much. And I would just really like to encourage everyone, as Allison will say, you know, the recording and the notes from the call and resources from the call today will be available to everyone who's signed up. And, and please share this with your poverty reduction uh, coalitions in, in your own communities. And, um, you know, we probably won't be convening, uh, you know, again before everyone's launching off and to, in, into this funding opportunity. So I really just like to wish everyone the best of luck, I think, and thank Vivica and Lorraine and Allison um, so much because, you know, with, with the support of these organizations, hopefully we'll see uh, unprecedented success across the province. So on that note, 
I'll just turn it back to Allison to wrap up the call. Thanks so much, Jill. Um, as you said at the beginning of the call, I know it can feel like a daunting, it's, it's a great opportunity, but can be a daunting one. So I hope that, um, I hope that everybody's feeling like if, if you are wanting to get an application in for this, that the supports are there for you to make sure that you are able to meet those requirements, meet the timelines, and then deliver on the promises of the grant. So um, thanks so much for, uh, to Vivica for such incredible local, really tangible high impact examples of what municipalities can do in terms of poverty reduction and, and the upstream approach to focusing our efforts, which I think all, all three of us our organizations really ascribe to um, and to Lorraine as well I know from you know from my work in Abbotsford I used to call Lorraine up at Spark and say hey I'm really looking for this piece of data and it was so incredibly helpful um, to be able to access that so I think that's gonna that access is gonna put communities in a much better place uh, in terms of creating those applications and also developing those evaluation frameworks when you know you have information beyond that high level uh, population level data and you can really get in uh, to understand uh, the demographics of poverty under those um, high impact game changer areas in your communities so thank you so much to both of you and I think like Vivica said at the beginning uh, this is really just the start of the support. I'll include all the resources, um, contact information, a few new resources that came up as part of this call in the follow up and we'll make the recording available so you can also share with colleagues if they may not have been able to make it today. Um, and thanks so to you, Allison, for your convening. It was uh, just a wonderful collaborative opportunity for the three of us to present. So thanks to you and Tamrak um, for, for facilitating that. Thank you. And to Jill, of course. <laughs> and Jill, that. yes, Jill. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> A yes. few upcoming learning opportunities um, before we take off today. Um, the first, we are really excited about our National National Poverty Reduction Summit that's going to be held in Calgary, October 14th to 16th, the end of poverty. We have the Save, Save the Date page up right now and we'll be releasing the full website uh, in the next couple of months once we've confirmed our keynotes. Um, for CRP members, you get two free seats to this gathering. Um, we also offer scholarships for folks with li lived and living experience to attend, um, support with some travel. Um, we'd love for you to be part of this conversation, so save the date. A couple of upcoming webinars, January 28th, um, the City of Toronto and the Democracy Collaborative are going to join us and talk about um, place-based approaches to building um, community wealth. We have another webinar, Building Social Capital Through Community Development. So once you've done your asset mapping, how can you engage residents from there to share their gifts and talents? Uh, this is gonna be with Lifehouse School. We have Asking Our Communities, A Journey to Understand Participation and Involvement. Um, this is with Lydia from the Vancouver Foundation, um, and it will be an exploration of how to engage community to get input on a particular issue. So this one might be especially relevant to uh, communities applying for Stream 1 and looking for ideas on how to really authentically um, roll out your community engagement processes. Um, Tamarack has a new, a new learning community um, uh, geared around youth and so we are putting together a photo contest for engaged youth um, to help us explain what youth are thinking and seeing in their communities. Um, you can learn more about the contest on the Tamarack website and I will be sharing all of these links um, in the follow-up as well. So our next call is scheduled for March 17th. Um, if you signed up, if you received the dial-in details directly for this, um, or uh, if you did not submit uh, to be part of the ongoing calls, um, I will send the link to make sure that you are able to join uh, the BC Community of Practice on an ongoing basis. We'd love to have you. 
Um, we are doing also a webinar uh, with Tristan Johnson from New Westminster around sourcing local data in early in early March. Um, so that may also be a theme uh, for the March phone call as a follow up, just looking at what's available the community data program. Uh, Lorraine really kind of sparked that for me today. Um, lots of communities using Help Seeker. Um, so to be confirmed, but March 17th at 11 o'clock. Note that we're moving to 11 instead of 10 o'clock moving forward. Hopefully some more folks will be able to attend who couldn't make the 10 o'clock times from last year. Uh, thanks again to everyone. I'm really excited about, about this grant opportunity and all the best as you put your applications together. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us uh, that were on the call today. Thank you so much, Allison. And uh, good luck, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.